Hang in there, it is. Dude, Smiley Kaufman for 61. Wow. I'm Smiley Kaufman, and this is The Smiley Show. Welcome back to another episode of The Smiley Show. Uh, I'm Charlie Hume. He is, of course, Smiley Kaufman, who is just back from a little event at Troubadour in Nashville that we're going to dig into later in the episode. Smiley, what are we? give us some opening thoughts. Let's break tradition here. How are you doing? I'm <laughs> good, man. Uh, had a great uh, weekend. I Actually, weekend would be... Uh, it was super chill. Like uh, the the event was on Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> the Friday. The pictures, pictures. I don't know if the pictures were super chill, but the, they were. They were. They were uh, something. Was, that's what I was getting to. Is that the weekend <laughs> here in Birmingham was super chill because of how much mm. fun Nashville was. I mean, just the best time uh, for the Justin Thomas Foundation um, event that he put on at Troubadour. So, I mean, for those that have been there, they know how great of a place Troubadour is. And just had such a good group of guys, group of guys that showed up, played played some golf. Actually, didn't play too bad. Um, but yeah, I, I can give you the full rundown if you want to get right into it. Well, here's what I was going to say. Is first of all, love to hear that you're playing well because you and I are headed off to Tobacco Road in a few days here to shoot our first piece of fall golf content for our YouTube that we're <laughs> thrilled about. So that bodes well for us. Uh, you know, putting a good score together as we kind of, you know, get back into the swing of things. Our first encore shoot since Pebble Beach back in February, whenever that was, beginning of the year. Uh, we got we got a ton of golf for a fall weekend. We had a wild finish at the Irish Open. Heartbreak for Roy McIlroy once again. We have Team USA reclaiming the Solheim Cup. A thriller of a finish there as well. We have Pat Kazire just won the Pro Core Championship, uh, a huge turnaround from where he ended up last fall into 2023 outside of top 25s, uh, 125. So super cool for him. And also a bunch of President's Cup guys to talk about who played in this field as well as to kind of tune up for that competition. We've got the Live Chicago individual championship john rom winning their implications for who's staying who's going next season we have uh of course the aforementioned justin thomas foundation event at troubadour <laughs> uh we have a tiktok i saw of jane's addiction getting into a fight on the stage and we have the north carolina tar heels quarterback situation so for the first time on the smiley show we are going to spin the wheel the rundown wheel we're going to see where it lands okay so okay, here we go great. let's go What do you know? Landed on UNC quarterback situation. I I, I, I don't control these things. It, it lands where it lands. So we just got to run with this. Smiley, do you have any thoughts on North Carolina's quarterback situation before I dive in? Well, I saw that Max Johnson's going to be returning for 2025. Mm. So I, I got really excited for you in in that regard. But mm. yeah, no, no, uh, nothing to say because I, I don't know who the quarterbacks are. We we have a quarterback, Smiley. We oh. have a QB one. We we played uh, North Carolina Central. Don't look up what conference they're in or what their win loss record is. Just just know that it's a very it's a tough uh, regional game. A lot of passion, a lot on, on the line. Jacoby Criswell, he's back he, back in the saddle. Did you say Griswold? J- uh, Criswell, uh, or Criz if for short. It's Griswold, yeah, yeah, Jacoby Griswold. Uh, <laughs> What narrowly lost the quarterback competition to Drake May transferred to Arkansas had had maybe he transferred back and he was the third stringer coming out of camp and had maybe the best excuse of all time. This is a quote from him. He said, Criswell said he lost 15 pounds since returning to UNC and that he's willing to lose more if the team needs him to. He said he had to gain weight to play in Arkansas's offense. So he began the process of shedding that weight after coming back to North Carolina. I also had to gain a lot of weight just in case Arkansas needed me to, to chip in for their <laughs> offense. So same page there, Jacoby. But he came in. We, we had a little we had a rough start to the game. I'm not riding off Connor, Connor Harrell, but, you know, wasn't what we wanted to see in the absence of Max Johnson. Jacoby was running the offense. He, he, he was looking good out there. So I think at this point, Smiley, it's CFP or bust. I think we're in the playoff. Dude, you're going to be in the Mayo Bowl. And it's <laughs> like, I, I, I need to get this. You're going to be probably playing South Carolina again. It's going to be a rematch every year. North Carolina, the- South Carolina, <laughs> Mayo Bowl. Mayo Bowl. 
<laughs> it's uh, you know, I, I love I love Duke's Mayo. Um, I love the occasional visit to Charlotte. Uh, please, for the love of God, can we play in just a different bowl? Just I, I just I'm I'm done with Mayo and and the Bank of America Stadium. I really I really would love to avoid that fate. How about South your boys? Carolina. Yeah, it was how about your most, boys? Listen, being an LSU fan, you go you have tons of highs and lows with any any sport that you follow with LSU. And this in uh, this game against South Carolina was probably the most highs and lows of any LSU game that I've experienced um, outside of any big game where you're, you're already have that heightened sense of just the the swings, right? Uh, and it was just, it was wild. I can't believe we won. Uh, we definitely had some calls go our way for sure, but I thought the refs were just atrocious in mm. general. Um, but it's hard to win on the road. So good, good for our, our guys not to be in that conversation with Florida, Florida State is just, just full, like hit the panic button. So dude, what? it's funny. It's funny that like winning can be contagious. And I think we got two layups coming up with UCLA and South Alabama. I'm hoping that heading into a bye, we can somehow get a team together to go and try to beat Ole Miss at home, which. Hopefully I'll be there for. Dude, what is happening to Florida State? Do you know they just hit their season win total under in the first? Did they really in week three? <laughs> week three, zero oh and three. I I just I can't fathom that. I I ha, I, I guess I need to watch more of their games. Maybe I don't because it sounds brutal. But like, is DJU this bad? What I I I can't fathom. I, I can't it's believe just they played brutal. Memphis. Like. Was that scheduled after Norvell? What do you think went to? Surely it was. No, 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 no. Because Norvell's in his like fourth or fifth year at this point. Sometimes those things get scheduled way, way in advance, right? Like it could be eight to eight to nine years, right? Where these games are scheduled way out. But is Memphis at home really that tough of a game? Like, are we, no, are we I'm just sharpening saying that one? I was like, I just, wow. I just think it's interesting that like Norvell lost to the team that he left. And I didn't know if mm. that Memphis said, you know what? Uh, Maybe when the, the contract thing was going up, they said, you know what? You can go, but you have to play us in X year. Um, Could be. I don't know. Yeah. That's... I know VCU was that way with Will Wade when he left to, to go to LSU. But so if maybe if Norvell was under contract with Memphis and could took be. the job, that could have been a caveat. They're past panic button. They're just like, they're, they're restart the game button. Like, just get me out of here. I just, I need to not be playing football anymore that's 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 uh, a real shocker but listen that's that's actually here's here's my nice little segues because you know college football tailgating the vibe by the way i made your snacks again this weekend made did the southern charcuterie do you make it the right way i used the remainder of what i had left over okay. uh so it so it's the we wrong way the wrong way there. but but we, everyone loved them this is going to be my new like go-to i need like a go-to tailgate move i didn't really have one other than just kind of bringing you know Happy Dad seltzers and a cooler, like that's pretty generic as far as that goes. Other guys grilling stuff, bringing you know chicken fingers, whatever. So this is my this is my go to thing now. I'm the Southern Charcuterie guy, and my, my buddy Rob Christensen tells me he's got a place. He's got a Publix. I'm I, I'm actually risking at this point of putting too many people on this who are going to beat me to get the Koneka. He's like, there's a there's a Publix and carry. You got to call ahead. The Koneka sells out in less than 24 hours. See, they all. That's what I'm telling you, man. Is that Koneka crazy. is ridiculously good. It's on. It apparently it's it's like the highest demand thing that they carry. I didn't know anything about it before. So he said, next time we're going to do it where he's going to bring the grill. We're going to grill the Koneka, take it right off the grill, slice it up. Yeah. Go hot Koneka on the if you if you have no idea what we're talking about, this was uh this was towards the end of Smiley's mailbag last week. And we also posted on our social media of a of a, a tail t- Smiley's favorite tailgate snack that's like a cracker, pimento cheese, Koneka sausage, which I'm told Smiley's told us is an Alabama delicacy, and then a wickle on top. And it is <laughs> so good. Try it out. Try it out. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, got, got lost, got lost in the mailbag there a little bit, but, uh, trans- the, the place I was trying to take us well, was, you, you, you got lost in the wickle jar there, buddy. I got lost in the wickle jar. <laughs> I got lost in, uh, I got lost in Koneka, Koneka land. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was attempting to take us from there to your weekend in Nashville because that felt like college football tailgate esque type of fun. And oh, I, for one, I got one picture that. I'm not going to describe. I'll, I'll let you describe everything that happened this weekend. But that was enough for me to know that I needed to know what about I, this weekend. What, oh yeah, okay, I remember <laughs> yeah, what I said too. Yes. <laughs> they got a great pick on Friday morning. But yeah, just just dial me in here on uh, dial me in here on on the weekend in Nashville at Troubadour for for JT's foundation. The week, the week 
end of the week. End of the week. That's right. End of the week in Nashville. So we leave uh, Wednesday morning and get there, I'd say, like just after lunch. And we had golf scheduled that afternoon. Had no idea who I was going to be playing with. Uh, called one of my buddies who's good friends with Justin Thomas, played golf with him in Alabama. Willie Sellers lives in Nashville. Um, and he used to work with this for discovery land. So like he was the guy to be like, Hey, you want to go play? And, and luckily he was like, yeah, let's go do it. So Willie, um, and I meet out there. Um, I, so I show up, I have lunch with Sam Burns and his wife and then Francie and I, and, and then Jill, Justin's wife. So we all have lunch. There was a big group of like eight guys out there playing on the golf course. And that's where Willie went straight to go out to play with that group, which was like Luke Bryan was in that group, I think. Um, and a bunch of other people too. And, but eventually like we, we te- I texted Willie. He's like, we're teeing off at two o'clock. Come on. And so we had nine, um, nine guys at two o'clock. And it was Sam and I. It was Willie and his brother, Doug, and Doug and I rode in the same cart and we had, let's see, one of Sam's buddies, Walker. We had Mike Thomas playing, uh, which was, which was great. Then we had Victor Hovland there, uh, out of nowhere. He was getting work done with Joe Mayo. So (laughs) Victor's there. And so is, is he there in a foundation capacity or no, just, uh, for he was fun? just there? He was just there getting work done amazing. with Joe Mayo. Like he just, just showed amazing. up on the tee, right? Is like, there's 15 golf carts on this first tee <laughs> and Victor shows up. I'm like, Vic, come on, buddy. Let's go tee it up. <laughs> and so Victor's now playing and, and Morgan Wallen's playing. So like, <laughs> it's just amazing. It's amazing. This, I mean, we just have this like great crew with, and then, uh, and Cole Swindell. So we got to oh, have like yeah, two country guys going at each other. Right. Yeah. So, so we what we decided to do because the first hole we're like okay five v four scramble with one ball and then we realized okay we're gonna birdie every single hole doing this and not everybody's (laughs) gonna get to play so we decided to do pick the your best two golf balls and then you can assign three to so the five-man team could assign three to one of those golf balls and two to the other or the four-man team which was me uh victor Mike Thomas and Willie Sellers' brother Doug. So it was us four versus the other five, and we had a we had a great match. Actually, we played automatic one downs, so it was. I, I mean, it was. Luckily, it got to, we had five bets at the end. It, somehow, we ended up scratch. I was keeping. I was a scorecard guy, so like I'm a big like call it even at the end anyway. So I was the perfect <laughs> keeping the scorecard guy for in this this situation, but um. Just had a great time playing golf uh, on that day. You know, it, at one point, I think this was the highlight of that day, right? So anytime you get like a country music station going, like on Spotify, and once you get past like your songs that maybe you'd already clicked, it just basically goes into a Morgan Wallen playlist. <laughs> and so <laughs> at one point, you know, you got all the cards like in there, you know, you got kind of golf carts everywhere in the fairways, right? Because you got four different golf balls you're playing. And Doug looked at me, he's like, I think I just I think I hear five different carts playing a Morgan Wall a different Morgan Wallen song right now. And I was like, this is And Morgan Wallen's in one of those carts. And he's in one of those carts. It's like this is this is hilarious. And by the way, uh I gotta give a shout out to Wallen. His game has gotten much better since the last time I played with him. What's what's he what's like his handicap roughly? Like if you had to guess. Uh we played him as a ten. Um, okay. So he can get it around. And this was just the front nine. So this is the front okay. nine. And now we go to the back where I would say, so the back nine, it was golden Tate showed up on the ninth hole and he joined us on the back. So it was golden. It was golden and Colt Cole, Cole Swindell and golden and Wallen and I, and I believe, I think Cole and I played golden and Morgan. That's right. That sounds right. Okay. And we we whooped up on them, and then Ricky showed up. So now Ricky Fowers <laughs> here on sure the same time that Cole Swindell leaves. So now we get a new game. So Ricky was this is still a back now. This is like the middle of the back. This is like the fifteenth hole. Okay, all right. So now we're Cole, on fifteen. Cole leaves. Ricky's in on the fifteenth. Got it. Okay. So that little four hole bet, uh, <laughs> myself and Swindell won, and then. Cole leaves, so now Ricky and I can't be on the same team. So we have to 
we flipped tees for partners then and i believe it was golden and i played morgan and ricky which we which we won i so think great day at the office for you yeah i just clean it I, up. I played i played well i could not believe it i had all the all the bad thoughts heading on that three hour drive up to nashville and just really uh you know, with with Joe Mayo behind all these people on these on these tee boxes, and and uh, I, I really brought my stuff. I, I was surprised, surprised myself. What was it, driving accuracy good? Like, were we were we? I went back like that night, um, and I was telling Fran, I was like, I don't think I missed a fairway. So, hold on yeah, a second. I drove it great, dude. I didn't miss a fairway. I don't think that's it. Like, if if we're if we have no high odds, I, I mean, we're, high we're, there, we're there. I did not hire one shot, but big. the next morning, Ooh. and we go out. Uh, so Wednesday night was chill. Thursday morning we push it up because of the hurricane, and so Thursday morning we go out. And, and, and is this this is the official? This is the foundation official foundation event. Got it. Which okay. I'll give you the guys that were that were playing. Uh, let's see. It I was. Got I got it right here. Um, here we go. It was Francie just sent me a picture of everybody. So I, I mean, should. do you want me to do you want me to read the names on the picture I'm looking at right now that you texted me? Yeah, go ahead. Because I got I've got I'm looking at Nick Dunlap, Scotty Scheffler, Justin Thomas, Tom Kim, Smiley Kaufman, Sam Burns, Ricky Fowler, and Jason Duffner. That's a yeah, that's a good looking photo right there. And the other celebrities that played in the deal that day were Cole Swindell and Kane Brown. Uh, okay. country music guy. So yeah, he, yeah. he was, I, I don't think I'm missing another guy, but those, that was the group. And basically it was just a typical prime. You play nine holes with one group, play nine holes with another group. Um, the, the funny part about if, just the golf that day in general was, you know, the, I, I show up kind of late to my tee on like number 12. And you know, when you show up after a day where you just hit everything great, and then you have this kind of sketchy range session, you, then you start to wonder, it's like, what, what happened yesterday? How did I kind of piece this thing together? And am I ready for pro am golf? Like, am I ready to be the pro? And I get up there, all the guys have already hit, and just it was the first. It wasn't a high yaw, but it definitely was one that was caught near the heel mm. and was heading that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, get to the next part three and I'm like, okay, surely like that was just a fluke. And then I high a seven iron, like just a similar type shot just happened to be with the seven iron. And so I get to the next tee and and, like my group's a little quiet at this point. They're like, holy crap, this guy's totally doesn't have it right now. (laughs) (laughs) So get to this part five and all the troubles, right? And I get up there and hit driver down the right side of the fairway and hit two iron, like like trouble all left and hit it on this like platformed green. And I was like, okay, we're good. And I played good the rest of the way. Just need to get settled down a little bit. That that's, you know, that's how that one goes sometimes. Good and, for you. Cause I, I, I mean, a lesser mortal would have just like melted down and been like, <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's back it in. Let's hit a lot of two irons on the tee the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. So the, the moral or why, why are we talking about the pro? I'm like, why does it, why does anybody care? And it's and the reason why you should care is that I was a part of a winning pro am team. Tom Kim was the other pro, and it was funny they they had two two teams that were tied. It was Tom and I versus I, I don't know who the other two pros were. Uh, fact of the matter was they couldn't figure out how to decide the playoff. So what they ultimately decided to do was to pick one person from each team to do flip cup. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, guys, guys, you, you can't have me do this, right? Because it's it's not fair. So you got to make sure you get uh, an am to do this. But I'm happy to explain to everybody in the crowd or the players that are going how it should be done. So of course, I get up there do my spiel. Uh, unfortunately, didn't do a one flipper. I think it was like a three or four. So honestly, yeah, that's a tough sure. scene. If, if you're gonna go up there and be the like the you know, the frat guy, it's like, oh, I, you know, I played last weekend, you know, which I haven't, I've played, I've played in three years, but got up there and <laughs> thought I'd be able to handle that challenge. And unfortunately, uh, didn't like three or four, but my, my guy won. Um, and they go through the, the trophy presentation and they're like, and for the pros, Tom Kim and Smiley Kaufman, you win 
a 12 year old bottle of pappy and i was like oh okay well this was worth the trip <laughs> and the in these pictures uh, which i i love these so much like tom kim is holding this bottle of pappy like it's the claret jug like he is elated to have he won is, this and all his everybody pictures. was so mad because I'm, I'm like 99 percent sure tom kim doesn't drink so all the guys that are <laughs> that are just like this is ridiculous like good paper tom, you do not go sell this <laughs> <laughs> so good is it correct is the last time that you have played flip cup against Sidney crosby and the pittsburgh penguins yeah, that's the last time I played flip cup. It's amazing. So you're you're just a high stakes flip cup guy. Yeah, which is well, that's I mean, the technically, way it be. like I didn't. I was just a maybe I just rise to the occasion once sure. the lights are on, and I yeah. I felt like that would have been the case. But uh, anyways, uh, so the we did it the sounds pro-am, like an amazing weekend. Do the pro am? Oh, it keeps getting just better. sounds incredible. <laughs> we're not to the good part. So <laughs> we have more. There's more. Oh yeah, we're oh, not to the good here part. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> so, please. So we go. Um, to a place called Chiefs, Eric Church's place. Uh, okay. Big bars, like six story deal. That's where the whole foundation event was. We do this Q and A on stage, which was incredible. Uh, Jason Kennedy uh, did the Q and A. We had all of the golfers up on stage, and unfortunately, there was one seat that was like a stool, and then that's where I, like I was the last guy on the stage. I was like, of course, guys. Like the players sit here, and anyways, I'm on this little small stool, and the highlights from that Q and A. Jason Duffner was sitting right next to Nick Dunlap and Nick the entire time. It it was funny because the question that Jason asked to whoever, I can't remember who he even asked it to was like, how have your significant others played and it had an impact on your career and how you're able to handle things on and off the course. And somehow it turned into Duffner asking Nick how long he's been dating his girlfriend and are you going to get engaged this weekend in front of, (laughs) like a thousand people right or was she not, there like yeah oh yeah she's in the oh, crowd i'm sure she's love, love like nick is just like beat red <laughs> and he's just like dude not right now and scotty the whole weekend too was i mean because nick is 20 right like he's not even yes. 21 so we want him to get these big x's on his hand and we're all like trying to make sure that everybody knows like hey y'all need to take a look at this guy like he's not 21 you know <laughs> and so that was a big that was a big funny moment the entire weekend was was with Nick at the bar. Like I just thought Duffner That's just so he was good. he he should be a comedian. The guy is the funniest man, driest like humor ever. Just so so funny. And uh he was a star of that that Kisner story at, at Zurich. I mean, that just cracks me up. Uh, yeah, they just went, when, when, uh, what was tough. it? When, when it was kids and Brown that would, used to party the entire now. time. <laughs> what are you now. boys going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> That's tough, man. He, oh, he man. was so funny. And so we get, um, so we get back home, right? So you, you, we, uh, we have a good time, right? Like we, get, I think leave like 10 PM. Everybody gets back on the bus. Of course I got the, the music going. So everybody has a good time. We come back, you know, play a couple drinking games here and there, you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Just what are we just, playing? Flip, not flip cup. We'll just keep it. We'll keep it up to okay, your imagination. That's, we'll that's keep it fine. PG that's here. Fine. That's great. And all I need, all you need to know is that, after all the events, you know, guys that are up just still just hanging out. Um, Golden Tate and I decided to go and play pickleball very late in the evening against Sam Burns and Scotty Scheffler. <laughs> and we played for oh, two hours. Okay. All right. <laughs> Amazing. So same teams the entire time. So you Golden's, were going against. Golden, Golden is really, uh, really good at pickleball. He has like his own pickleball paddle coming out we talked about this like on the course like going we need to play pickleball so it was kind of like a seed was planted and i think golden like just kept bringing it up like let's go play pickleball let's go play pickleball and so eventually it was just it's like four there were four guys left and like okay let's go play pickleball and scotty and and sam are like psychotic competitors right like even i would say scotty more so than like at that point like sam and i just picture us as the two guys that just wanted to fake injuries. Like we just wanted to go down and, and just, just like, ah, oh, cramp, you know, just something to get us out of having to exercise. Cause we were, we were both pretty tired. You know, he's obviously got a four month old who's hadn't been sleeping oh, as man. well that, that week. So he's already kind of tired, but Golly. what, when I went up here and played, cause this hurricane's like still kind of like the yeah. remnants are still there. So we got to, 
25 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour crosswind off of the left and playing pickleball. And we probably played seven games. And it, this well, is like, this is in a night now, right? Like we're talking yeah, about we like, had, like we under golf, the lights. We had golf carts on, on the court lighting up the court. Like so, this is late. Wait, it's like late it's at late. night. We're playing two it's hours late. pickleball and a 25 early. mile per hour hurricane. Wind. Yeah, God, it's amazing. It's just it's, amazing. And so we get, you know, we get to play in pickleball and, you know, I, I have a good serve. And that was something okay. that like I was able to hang on to for a bit. And then I really started to struggle with just getting returns back. Ooh, and yeah. it was it, it was just mainly because the ball was moving so much. I I had started to realize that that Scotty may be the best pickleball player on tour um, and and potentially good enough to turn pro. And I don't I, I don't, Not I don't a say that lightly because he's the best pickleball player I've ever played against. And after after Sam and I uh, bowed out because we played however many games um, and I don't know who I, I, I would say that it was fairly even between the games. Um, maybe maybe once maybe they won one more. Maybe we won one more. I'm not really sure because uh, it was much more of a gambling uh, sh- deal than it was a like a series deal. It was like, hey, what are we playing this game for? So that was that was much Love more that. of the pickleball. And then Sam and I stopped playing, and then Golden and Scotty played, and hopefully we get Golden on on the uh, pod here pretty oh, soon. Please. I'll let him. Amazing. I'll let him tell this the story of of uh, of them two playing because I don't want to give away the good stuff. Are, are you? Are, do you uh, hit the serve in the air, or do you let it bounce off the ground and hit it? I hit it in the air. Do you hit it off the ground? I, apparently, you can do that. You can bounce it and hit it off the ground. Yeah, or hit on no, the air. No, you got hit out of the air. And, okay, all right. This is that was kind of like that was like kind of a question, you know, like first time you t- you know you just picked up the game of golf and you said, "What time are we shooting today?" Like that that was kind of like your no, pickleball, no. like what time are we shooting today? Like you you, know? you you get some you get some guys out there that'll do the little the little, I, I I I mean I, I'm not good enough to pickleball. I, I played you know like these social leagues at our club and we we tried to play a league locally here and quickly realized like we were way out of our depth. So I, I'm not like a pickleball hard. I'm just curious. I want to you know unpack the mechanics of your serve see how you're getting on against these boys but <laughs> scotty being incredible at pickleball doesn't shock me he's probably i mean i i'd be hard pressed to what sport is he not better at everyone else on, on tour dude it, it, basketball is like he's, whole, he's out there hooping the whole drive home i i just kept thinking to myself it's like all right so like i know scotty's really good at golf and right. he's the best in the planet at it but i think i know why and it was just how good of an athlete it is like the touch that he had on this court like yeah. it's the same touch that he has with his wedges how competitive he is and then the how he mentally had me in a <laughs> in a blender in this game i got him just like just the mind games of like balls being yeah. in or out just like i i was like i had enough of these bad calls because sam like i got we got sam and i got in the cart after we played i was like sam like if it was close, were you calling it in or calling it out? I was like, oh, I was calling it everything out. I was like, Sam, <laughs> what the hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just was, it was very competitive. And then once, like, once the competitive juice ran out of me, I was, I was like, can we just, can we just fake injuries? <laughs> this is amazing. And then, and then Golden and Scotty just continued to play pickleball. Yeah, they played a couple more, lights. couple more games. Sam and I watch, and then we go home, slept a fair amount of hours, not many. And then, uh, yeah, drove, drove home and, uh, been just kind of taking it easy this weekend, <laughs> yes. taking it nice and light. <laughs> One would hope, golly, that's amazing. I really, we really need to get golden on. I, I want the full unpack on this. I, I wish we had footage of this, like the, 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 the video of Scotty floating around, uh, playing pickup basketball in the pine Valley shirt. Like this could do numbers on the internet. If we only have the content available, we do have, we do have videos, Ooh. but you, you will not see them. <laughs> 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 that's fair enough that's fair enough we'll just leave the rest of the imagination well dang okay that sound that's an amazing week heading into the weekend and i, I hope you're i hope we're, we're feeling a little better now i hope we got some oh, sleep yeah, yeah that was yeah. good uh yeah. it was, shout out to justin um and jill and his entire family and team just put on a tremendous event um you know eric church and, and cole swindell played at at the concert that night so it was just a treat to get uh front row seats for that and uh, just to get to hang with such a good, cool group of guys was uh, a lot of fun. That That is exceptional. All right. So we're going to work on Golden. We're going to get the full Scotty Pickle report. We'll paint <laughs> a vivid picture. Uh, okay. I'm not going to use the wheel 
this time around. I'm, I'm going to let you decide where we want to go next. Do we want to do... I mean, I watched the Irish Open today, so I kind of want to go there. That's please... Because that... Okay, let's just start with this in the Irish Open before we get to the finish. Because the finish was unreal. But how amazing is it seeing Royal County Down on television? I know it doesn't like fully do it justice, but just seeing a professional event at Royal County Down is just... I love that so much. It, it, it's, um, it's incredible, right? I, I just try to think about... Um, I think a lot of people love watching the Masters because of the visuals and just that that late late light at the end of the day, watching mm-hmm. guys come down the stretch and just think to yourself, "Man, I would love to stand on these grounds and just have an opportunity to see and uh, what this place really looks like in person." And I I got all of those feels watching Royal County down. I just pictured myself being there, wanting to play this golf course. And uh, yeah, it's number one on my list of golf courses I want to play. And for all of you that are listening, we're watching that have played. Uh, yeah, please, please tell me how great it was and, and how jealous I should be of you because it uh, it really did look incredible. Some of the images I saw this week of Rory, uh, you know, playing, you know, very, very close to home. I grew up in, an hour away, according to uh, what they said on the coverage. So, uh, yeah, just just had a blast watching it. We talk a lot on the show about just the realities of professional golf. There's, of course, the pie in the sky scenario where we get to play all the places we want to and money's not an object. And then there are, of course, uh, certain reasons why we have to go to certain places, not necessarily that they're bad venues, it's just that they are, you know, there's money behind it, there's sponsorship interests, there are things like that that necessitate certain tournaments being in certain places and certain venues being used. I think it's so cool when you have an opportunity to go to a place like Royal County Down where it feels like none of that's attached. And it's just a, a pure form of golf. Uh, it's just a place that is, you know, understand why we can't do it every single time. But this venue uh, is is exceptional. And this finish was exceptional today. I mean, I I, I can't believe yet again we're, we're looking at a Rory McIlroy National Open heartbreak. But Rasmus Hoygaard finishes birdie, birdie, birdie to get this thing won. And on the other hand, Rory goes bogey, birdie, bogey and narrowly misses an eagle putt, makes birdie, misses a playoff by a shot. So we were watching this texting together. I mean, I just – I the three putt for me on, on 17 for Rory, I just – I don't know how that happens like that. Well, gosh, um, let's just kind of take in just – can we compare this to anything else? Like does it feel like the U.S. Open? Does it feel like the – the open championship at St. Andrews and just kind of compare, you know, what was today like as far as like closing a golf tournament and was it as excruciating as, as some of those felt like they were. And, and today it just felt like to me, you know, when he had a two shot lead with six holes to go and you look down the board and and you're starting to think yourself, he's like, man, I I just don't see a world in which Rory doesn't win this golf tournament. Um, And you know, the open championship at St. Andrews, I would say that, you know, the putter, you know, he just wasn't hitting it close enough. And then the putter just went cold on him. Mm-hmm. The, and when we talked about the U S open, you know, even speaking with Rory after it seemed like he got a little caught up too much in the moment, lost focus on 16 and then got too much into what Bryson was doing and just kind of threw him a little bit out of rhythm. And with this one, you know, when I talk about how how hard it is to win golf tournaments, now, when you're in a situation with a two-shot lead, it just seemed like so much had to go wrong if unless Rory played poorly. And in this position, I, I would I would say that he missed two shots, right? Like the 15th hole, he had a second shot there that I felt like he had plenty of room to the left. I know missed shots happened, but it just seemed like that was the one place that you couldn't hit it. Um, ends up making a bogey there. It seemed like that was an avoidable bogey. So there's one shot. 16 hits an incredible three wood on that par four drivable and puts himself in a great position to make a birdie and then goes to 17 where I, that that second shot was giving guys problems the entire day. And this is where I'll bring in Rasmus, right? So he he was having a day in which everything was going right. Mm. Everything was going right. You know, the the stuff that happens to guys on like Thursday morning starting the tournament, they shoot 64 and everything went right. His happened to be on a Sunday afternoon within a couple shots of the lead. And 
where it really was, it was on the 14th hole for Rasmus on the same, on the same hole where Rory flags an iron shot comes up like 25 feet short on, on this par three 14th hole. Rasmus pushes it right into, I would call the, their primary rough bounces out of it and inside of 10 feet makes a birdie and then now gets to 16 makes a birdie on that hole. So like you get a little bit of a lucky bounce and a fortunate break. And so now he's getting, you know, he's in that position now where he's got an opportunity to win. Can he put the pressure on and post the score gets up and down out of the bunker on 16, 17 hits a very poor shot into the left bunker. That seemed like when Hoygaard said later, he said, I thought it was going to plug. I get up there. It was on enough of an upslope and hits just the most darling bunker shot you've ever seen. It goes in the middle of the flag stick. I took a screenshot and you could even see the ball from behind the view of the bunker because this ball is literally in the middle of the stick. And so that was, that was, it turned out that to be the difference in the golf tournament, right? So Rory plays, I think the 17th hole, the smart way you know, this pin is tucked back in this small, small, narrow area. And it really takes a, a, a shot that if you're going to get it back there, you got to be very brave because, you know, missing in that left bunker most of the time is bogey. So you got to play short. So the difference is, is Hoygaard gets it in this bunker, finds an okay lie, makes birdie. And then Rory from 30 feet puts it off the green, misses an eight footer, and now has to make an eagle on 18, which it was a valiant effort. I mean, to drive it in that small, small Amazing. area like he did, hits an eight iron up there into that front left hole location. It was so hard to get it close and gives himself a, uh, an opportunity to, to make a putt, hit a good putt. And, and you just leave yourself like, I can't imagine when Rory saw what Hoygaard did on how he made his birdies. He's just got to think to himself, you know what? Yes, I can look back at those two shots and I probably could have done better. And and he should expect that from himself because that's what you have to do to close tournaments. And in this, unfortunately, in this situation, I, I will say I feel like Hoygaard had a bit of luck on his side mm -hmm. and Rory uh just wasn't able to do the the simple things on on I, I wouldn't call a the the iron shot on 15 a simple shot, but something that I would say he regularly would be controlling his golf ball into an area to where he would make a par there. But I don't know, Charlie, it just leaves me in a, like, I, I see the comparisons now on online that say, man, this reminds me a lot of Greg Norman during his prime. I didn't watch Greg Norman uh, growing up as a kid. So it's hard for me to, to, to put that in perspective of, is it, is it similar? But I know Rory won a, he's won a ton of times. He knows how to win golf tournaments. So I don't have an issue with it, it just seems like it's a much more of a recency thing. Yeah, it's, it is interesting where you open, you know, your sort of thoughts on this, comparing it to the 2022 Open Championship and the 2024 U.S. Open. Because if you think about it, there there is elements of, of both in it. it. It's, you know, not to say that Cam Smith got lucky uh, in St. Andrews in 2022. I mean, he made a, a very legit charge from behind to win it. But you had that that sort of angle of Rasmus Hoygaard finishing with three straight birdies to kind of, you know, slingshot himself around Rory. And then you had the, you know, in the same way that that uh, at the U.S. Open, you know, that that 16th hole where he, he leaves that putt behind the hole and has a comebacker that's, you know, a tricky one the way he putted 17 to just, you know, I, I know he wanted to make a run at it up the hill to give himself a chance to, to make a birdie and really kind of extend that lead and, and win in style. But just to leave it where he did eight feet coming back is just, you know, it's inexcusable. Um, and so I, it's, it's a tough, tough loss. And I, I just, I wonder, is it, it's, it's an interesting one because it, it's a, it's a fall season event. It's an off season event, so to speak. So I think in most people's minds, you'd say, is it really that big of a deal? But obviously this one is, is it maybe is. the nearest and dearest to Rory's heart. Cause it's his national open. Yeah, it is. It would be like you going to play the Wyndham championship, me playing the Zurich classic. It it's, it's the event that you want to win the most. It's where, where you grew up, right? Like this is the tournament, the venue too. Like, you know, this is when Royal County down shows up, you're like, man, that would be a really cool place to win. And, um, unfortunately for Rory, he wasn't able to get it done, but you had to just love, you know, as a, as a viewer, just having a golf course as good as this, oh, it's with, so good. 
with, you know, Rory needing to make an eagle on the last hole. I, you know, I would have loved to see Rory coming down 18 with the two shot lead and get to, you know, hear the fans with his support behind him. Not, not to say that they weren't supporting him all week, but man, it was, um, it was really cool just to watch the fans circle in behind him on 18 to watch him hit that putt because, you know, they wanted that ball to go in just as badly as Rory did. Oh, without a doubt. And, and it's, you know, Roy will be back. I, I think he's had an interesting off season where he's been asked about number of events he wants to play. It looks like he's going to cut his schedule down. I, I, you know, still question marks as to where the next major is going to be, what it's going to look like and, and just yeah. his career in general. I mean, I just think ah. there's been a lot of, you know, I, 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 I it'll be, it, I, I don't think even though this one is important to him because of that connection to your point, you know, this is, this is the one that's at home. You know, I, I think the ones that'll still burn, like, Nothing's going to burn like a chance to add to his major count this year at the U.S. Open. And maybe, you know, now that he's kind of past that, I'll just be very interested to see the way he opens up this year and how he plays early on in 2025. Yeah, totally. And, uh, you know, he's been he's still vocal about the world tour and wanting yep. to get a deal done. So I, that's one thing to monitor, too, with him as well is is like, does he ever get to a point in all of this where he just gets so tired of the PGA tour and nothing getting done. And then just deciding, you know what? Like, I, I don't think he'd ever go to live. Like it would, mm -hmm. it would shock me, but that would be something just in my mind. It's like it, things would have to go terribly wrong, but he just hasn't stopped talking about it. So I keep thinking that it's mm -hmm. not over in his brain about wanting to get this done because I don't, I don't know exactly, uh, you know, what, his next where he sees himself over the next five to 10 years for his playing career on how many events he wants to play. Cause to your point, that's something that he talked about that maybe he needs to cut down on his, on his schedule just a bit. Yeah. I think the thing for him that's, that's tougher than others who have made the leap uh, is exemptions. Like if it's, if to him, it's important to continue playing in major championships, you know, a move, a move that, uh, while Smiley gathers himself after a long pull on his, uh, Stanley Cup, are we, are we, we good go. there? <laughs> are, we, are we all the way back? Yeah. That's, you know, that hydration is important. You just got to be careful with it. Uh, I, uh, I'm, fight, I'm fighting for my life. I'm fighting for his life. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I, on Rory, I, that's a difference for me. It's like Rom wins a major has exemptions for the next, you know, five years at least, lifetime at most, and can go and feel a little more comfortable. Um, you know, Brooks Kepka, similar situation. Uh, even like a Cam Smith winning the Open Championship. But I, I just yeah, you're saying exemptions for for Rory. I mean, yeah, I guess like some of these exemptions run out for him because the, right. the last time he had won a major what was it ten years ago? Is that exactly so like, 2014? So it, it's P That's PG, I think PGA is is if I have this right, PGA is ten, US opens ten, and uh, well, his world ranking would keep him in. You would sure. imagine for two years, sure, give or take. Masters, he would get a special invite. You would have to imagine, or would he? I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, dude, maybe stop. stop. <laughs> I mean, but do, do you do you think? I, I guess, I guess, I, 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 I'm, I'm not saying based based on playing merit at all. Like, I think it's undoubtedly well, well, these are, the, we're too far down the hypothetical yeah. tree with this that I don't even think we need to go there. It's I just, I it's just wanted just to say that you know what, I, I, I just read the tea leaves and all this stuff, right? Yeah. And he just seems to me like a guy that wants to get something done, and I, I don't know if it'll get done for next year. For now. sure. Well, and I think to to his credit, I mean, like, I think it's it's fair. Any international player that decides to go play on live, like, I may not agree with it, but I understand it because they want a more international experience. And I can't, you know, I can't fault them for that. That is something that lives doing that's worth, you know, trying to incorporate into any sort of tour. Make it global uh, if you're really trying to grow the game. So uh, is that does that feel like a do we want to segue into live Chicago individual yeah, championship think, off that? I think so. Let's do, All right, let's do it. Let's do it. We're just live producing this thing today. So John Rom. Oh, good news, by the way. Uh, okay. Gold, tell me. Golden Tate um, is good to record. So we should have a Golden oh. Tate in our feeds uh, this week. So uh, that, that'll that be nice. Live update on the pod. So that means you guys have some Scotty Scheffler pickleball stories to look forward to. <laughs> 
So <laughs> do not miss that one. Uh, that's going to be electric. So, uh, well, fantastic. So bump it over to live. Now we got John Rom. John Rom wins this individual championship is second win in his last three events, which this is a sort of an interesting one to discuss. Cause really, I think as recently as post open championship where he did finish top 10, he finished tied for seventh, but looking back at his major record this year, where he had to withdraw from the U S open misses the cut of the PGA finishes tied for 45th at the masters. We were asking questions as to, you know, how does he feel about this year? If his goal was to go over and play well, live, I, I you know, I, I knew he was near the top of the individual standings at that point, but you know, maybe hadn't won yet. And, and just saying, can he consider this a success? And then really ripped off a, a huge close of the season. He made $38.2 million this year, 34.7 as an individual. It's a shout out to our Sick. guy, Sean, Sean Lowry, bringing in the, the live uh, stats and information, which by the way, teed up with Sean Lowry out of Trayburn this I don't last know week. If it's, I don't know if it's just you. Like, I, I just don't care like how much money they make. Like, that's like, if there's it one is, thing about any of this, it's about more money that they're making. None of that is a bit. <laughs> well, it, it's more so just an illustration of this, you know, what it, it, it is silly money. It's hard to even like, uh, you know, compare that to, is that good? Well, is that bad? It's a lot. Well, let's just compare it to like the NFL, dude. I yeah. mean, even what Scotty made this year, I, I think what the Saudis have done is totally inflate the golf market because it's not sustainable. But you know, this, this live golf model is if, if they did not have the, we would, I mean, everybody knows this, if they didn't have Saudi backed PIF on all this, that none of this would be even possible. It's, it's make believe we'd still be on the PGA tour. And that's where I just get still just so annoyed by just when I hear what these players will say about, you know, we need to get back together and this and that it's like, dude, like you have hit the absolute lottery because it's just, it's just fairy tale land. Yeah, it, it's I mean, I, you're not going to get a disagreement from me on any of that. I, I think it's uh, I think the thing that's probably most frustrating from a viewer perspective or a fan perspective is that we're at this sort of impasse between two sides that are both doing something that feels unsustainable, but unwilling to try to kind of find some way to kind of make it work. And because it's just I think in the absence of trying to find something that make makes it work. It, it, the future is not going to be great for pro golf. Like there just has to be a, a way to kind of get this thing. Yeah. And, and I don't know who caves first on that and, and who has the longer lead because I, you look at the PIF and seemingly having, you know, as much money as they want to given their reserves, but how much of that is actually being set aside and going into this live product, you know, it's, it's anyone's guess. And then on the, on the, on the tour side, it's like you had this, this group of investors has injected a ton of cash and we're talking about ways we're going to innovate. And, and, and a lot of that's been done. You know, we're kind of trying out new products or, you know, I, I love that, um, you know, in addition to the TGL and things like that, we're also trying things out like the creator classic to lean into some of these younger demos, you know, and, and probably doing more of that in the future. Like at least we're trying some stuff there, but I don't think that money's endless either. And so it's just, when do we run out on either side and whose hand is kind of forced to come to the table and bring it back together? Because well, the, I, the, I, can you have two products like this forever? I don't think so. Well, I, I would probably argue that that still, I feel like live is in a better position because I think money still wins in most, most everything, right? Money will always win. And I, I think both sides need each other, but I think the two are, long-term needs needs players top level players that that draw more eyeballs and more viewers and i think that's to me where i think the tour kind of has to probably concede first in all this yeah it's it's uh, you know i i tend to agree with that and, and this is taking us a little bit away from the topic itself which is kind of attempting yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. recap you know the live oh, yeah. but but i think it's it's all part of the conversation so just to, to quickly run through it because it's worth mentioning you got rom finishes first in the individual standings joaquin neiman second how about sergio garcia third had a, good year. This, had a yeah. really good year um some interesting kind of notables in here you got you know tyrell hatton fourth brooks kepka fifth um cam smith seventh bryson eighth uh taylor gucci year after kind of playing incredible finishes 10th um dj down to 14th where it gets kind of interesting is 
there's this sort of there, there are these three zones, right? So this lock zone ends at 24 players. All those guys are safe. They're set for next year. Then there's an open zone where if you're not a captain uh, and you finish between 25th and 48th, you could be traded. You could be re- you replaced on your team. So, you know, names in that list that are interesting are Peter Uline's in there, um, Graham McDowell, Thomas Peters, Ch- Charles Howell III. I'm naming all the non-captains because the captains are, of course, safe in that zone. Caleb Surratt in his first year over finishes in that zone. Harold Varner III, um, Mito Pereira. The drop zone is, is highly intriguing because – you have, uh, you know, there are a number of names where, you know, the, the Vincent brothers are, are, are getting relegated. Uh, Brandon Grace, another name worth noting in there after playing kind of well early on at Liv. Uh, Bubba Watson will, in fact, despite being the captain of the Range Goats, will be relegated. And so is this sort of is this it for for Bubba? I know he's kind of made made waves in the past of saying I'll just do the team ownership thing. But if he can't play on Liv and he can't get his status back on tour, Unless he kind of tries to qualify through this international series, requalify back in, it, it, which I don't think he do. This is kind of it, right? I I don't know. I, I still am trying to figure out how this whole thing works. I guess Bubba could get re-signed um, by somebody. But, maybe. but he's his own captain. It's like it's like such a strange thing. It's like he he I guess theoretically owns the franchise, but to me you know, it, it would. It would probably he would get into the TV side would be my guess. He'll probably be in some some way, shape or form involved with live telecast, whether it's an analyst or an on course guy. I don't know um, that that to me is probably the route he's going to go, which is which is wild, it's kinda, right? It's like kind of interesting, right? Yeah, um, he just didn't seem like to me of all of like the guys that are getting older to be the like guy that wants to quit and, lo- and loses his game the fastest. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, oh, 100%. Feels like he always had the length, the creativity. Like, he seemed to me like a player that, that would, like, age, age more like a fine wine, I guess, with his game. Well, yeah, I mean, he he is – he's 45 years old, which isn't young, but it's younger than Phil Mickelson. And that's a guy who I thought was going to hang him up, you know. And, and Mickelson has still made his own sort of waves about considering retirement if he's not playing well. He finished 46 this year, so he was just three spots above that drop zone where I guess technically the way they've written it, even as a captain this year, he could have been relegated and booted off his team. So I, yeah, I mean, maybe you see both that. those guys. Yeah, I mean, Phil, Phil being involved with the vo- broadcast, um, it's if if Liv is able to get uh, a a really good TV, like a TV deal with Phil Mickelson, Bubba Watson on the, like, I, I think that starts to elevate what they're doing to me in my, in my mind is just a general person that follows golf and, and knows, um, you know, just a bit about the TV business, right? Like Phil was who he was always supposed to retire and be an analyst, um, on the PJ tour. Right. And, and now I feel like, if if anything, Phil's got this thing started. He's going to make sure he's going to finish it. <laughs> so, without a doubt, I mean, I I think this, you know, for both Bubba and Phil, it's like that's kind of your only play, right? Like you, you don't really have anywhere else to go. You're not going to get welcomed back in, in a different golf setting to to be playing or commentating. Yeah. So it's just you're, you're all your chips are in on live, and you're either you know if you're not going to be playing, you can hop up in the booth with them, and that's kind of. That's kind of their option. So it's I mean, interesting. The The only other interesting thing I would say about it all is who's going to be the first player to come back in in this and whether it's a Brooks Kapka, whoever it is, I, I just, I'm interested to see, you know, cause it's eventually going to happen, right? Like there's going to right. be a player that um, goes back through the process of whoever it might be, whether it's Hudson Swafford, who is a player that, you know, used to be on the PJ Tours one a couple times. He's not going to get re-signed at Live. He was on. He was a a guy not even on a team this year. Played very poorly, um, shockingly bad. Uh, considering like I know Hudson and how good of a player he is. I don't know if he's got an injury or just doesn't want to play. But that's I know how golf is. It's hard for me to I know how hard this game can be. Uh, so hopefully he can get be the first player to kind of work wake, work his way back on tour. Yeah, it will be interesting because obviously the 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 he's on the wild card side of things where you know his best case scenario with Liv is asking to come back again and play as a wild card and potentially you know 
fill in for teams who need a spot start for guys who are, you know, injured or have to withdraw for whatever reason. Uh, Anthony Kim also in that similar wild card situation this last year. But I, I'm interested in like the name you started with Brooks Kepka, guys like that who had a contract signed and are, you know, nearing the end of that contract, let's say, and deciding whether they want to re up and stay with Liv or whether they want to kind of by some way, shape or form re-enter the ecosystem to come back and play on tour. And, and that's one that to your point, yeah, yeah, it should happen sooner rather than later. The only thing I, I know I said, I don't care about the money they make. The only, I would be, the only thing I would be interested in just for, so that it's easier to follow from our perspective is that when we look at this, like when we look at their standings, I wish we could see how many years they were signed on with this team. And if they want to put how much they're making too great, uh, they don't have to, but it would be cool I think from my from my side of things, it's like, how many year deal do you have with this team? That that to me is is like I, I would be interested to see if if you know Harold Varner has like one year left on his deal with whoever the heck team four is aces. on the, the four aces. Yeah, I've, right. I, yeah. I, I've, I've got a I've got a note here from uh, Sean who says uh, if the Iron Heads and the four aces need to rebuild. So take that for <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Rebuilding year for both of them. Well, so and and that I, I actually think I don't think they have a contract with a set team. Like I think it's a contract with a league because I think that's how you get arrive at the spot where if you end up in that open zone, you know uh, you could. I, I think I think you have a contract with the team. I do. I, I do. I, I think maybe I think so. You get I, signed to the team. I, I could be wrong though. But I, I think it's I really do think it's it's there's more flexibility and movement outside of the captains. I think that than you we sign with is. both like you're you're signing with live golf. Yeah, you like so I'm sure that's a whole nother thing. But then you get you get pursued by these different captains um, like or for instance, the trade that they did with Taylor Gooch and Matthew Wolf. Right. Like that like you got traded to this team and there's a contract just like I I think like <laughs> You were you were talking to the wrong guy. If you I, wanna, I would be interested. <laughs> I would be more interested in that stuff if we actually yeah. knew what the heck was going on. Like, there's just nobody. Right. It just seems like, oh yeah, you, you well, can just trade whoever. It just it's hard to figure out. And and that's I think. And, and I don't want to critique without knowing if there's been more public disclosure on this. But I think that was part of the critique of the whole Matthew Wolf or just some of the trades that happened last year is just that it was so clearly. One just sided. orchestrated. Yeah. One sided just trying to make certain people happy. And I think, you know, it, it's look, it, it's the, there's a part of it that's difficult. You're a startup. You have to create some degree of flexibility so that if you get something going and it's clearly not working, it's not like this ironclad thing that can't be changed. Like you need to be able to, to be fluid enough to fix it so that the league and the teams work in the best way. It's just that it's going to look a little rinky dink while you try to kind of get the thing up to speed. And I, I think that, you know, I did hear that that trade with Matthew Wolf and Taylor Gooch because at the time, right. Matthew was, you know, wherever he was on the points list. I don't know if it, I don't think he had quite as nearly as good as viewers he had this year, but Taylor Gooch was having that crazy good year. So yeah. uh, it would, it would be weird. Like you'd have to trade a lot, right? Like, or mm -hmm. like you have to pay a lot of money. And I did hear that Brooks pay. He was, I said, I'll, I'll pay whatever, like get, go, shoo, <laughs> and paid X wow. for, for Taylor. So I think okay. there, was, there was some there cash was cash there. considerations. There was there was that like large <laughs> cash considerations. That's what we need to know. We need that to be reported. I, We're going to care that. so I, much I, more. I, it's been so long since I heard whatever the number was. I wish I remembered, but it was like a seven figure type. Wow. Breaking breaking news. Smiley Smiley Coffin breaking news right here on the Smiley Show. And there was cast news, considerations. And you could put that in the category of he thinks he remembers it was X. Yes. That yes. that's like it's like the it's like a, a lower third graphic. And the first line says breaking news, cast considerations were part of the deal to bring Taylor Gooch to uh smash and the second line is he thinks smiley cop and thinks he remembers someone telling him this at some point <laughs> it's a wordy graphic where we'll we'll let we'll let our graphics team figure that one out uh <laughs> that, that feels like enough live yeah. discussion or speculation uh obviously not our strong point we're, we're running out of things on our rundown checklist uh you want to talk a little solheim cup before we finish up with some pga tour yeah i i love this like i'm gonna start i'm gonna start first with you know making this all about myself, which is usually a good topic as it, as it uh, you know, if you're going to try to 
be in, in media and host a podcast, things like that. Make it all about yourself. That's a really good play. Um, as someone who's on the cusp of becoming a girl dad, I was watching this, you know, over the weekend. I was like, I'm really bummed my daughter's not here now. So we could like sit on a couch and watch this. Cause there are all these little, these little girls that were with their dads, their moms who had, you know, little American flag face paint and, or, or little, you know, the, room for the euros as well a little flag just all i just thought it was it was really cool to see the way in which you know uh, there have been a lot of efforts you know especially in the states but just with all these these major women's professional leagues to you know kind of support it more get more eyeballs on it some of those things kind of feel like you know let's call it like half-assed attempts or, or just you know stuff that where the the substance doesn't match this event itself was like this was easy to, to, to root for. This was easy to get up for. I know there was some hiccups on site, like getting people there via buses or whatever. But then once the thing started, there was intrigue all weekend long. And it came down to a great Sunday single session where Lilia Vu stuffs a wedge on 18 to make birdie and win the thing for Americans. And so there's my like, very self-absorbed, you know, observation on this thing. But I, I just like I'm I'm excited to watch future iterations of the Solheim Cup with my daughter. There, there you go. There's my there's my entry point. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the US gets the cup back. They had one since 2017. So that was cool to see the United States side win on home soil. And actually where the uh where they played the event uh used to be the the beginning uh, or the original site, I should say, for uh, the President's Cup. I yes, so they've hosted a number uh, a number of President's Cup there. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, the golf course, I I, I enjoyed. Uh, it was cool that I assume that's a lake or a river right there. Yes, it's a big yeah. whatever it is. Um, so that was a cool backdrop. Uh, so I, I enjoyed watching it. it. It was really nice and appealing to the eye. I loved. Uh, I guess like to your point, it seemed like the, the first day was a bit of a miss with the transportation that did that you, did you look like, into that at all? It's just my least favorite thing in the world. Like I hate parking in, in big parking sure. lots away from wherever I'm trying to go and then hopping on a bus that already is of, of things I don't like to do. It's so far down the list of, of enjoyable things I, I've, I've experienced in my life. And so when you throw that on top with like really terrible logistics with it, that's, that's just really, really poor form from, uh, from, uh, I guess it's the LPGA that's that's running this thing. So yeah, the um, commissioner kind of took responsibility for that. Just can't, uh, that just can't. Just can't happen. happen man. Yeah. I mean, I understand that. Yeah, that sometimes it takes a bit to get in, and that's what I was talking about. I told enjoy doing, you know, getting on buses, but it's part of the deal. And sometimes you just, you know, it's going to take thirty or thirty or so minutes with that whole process, but it shouldn't take multiple hours. And I think that's what was going on. Um, but yeah, uh, for what I watched, I. I watched him a lot of the golf today. That shot that uh, that she hit on on eighteen. Oh I mean, my she god! Just, she just birdied uh, on seventeen because she was two down. Yes, makes birdie on seventeen and then makes birdie on eighteen. I thought that clutch gene was amazing. Uh, and uh, yeah, Charlie Hole, you know, winning six and four. And I saw a, a tweet uh, that uh, that Charlie Hole winning six and four, the, the cigarette in her mouth. And then I could see there was a picture of Nelly Cord and showing. Charlie Hole that that graphic that was posted and so that to me was that was awesome I just like yes. that was behind the scenes something that we should have seen but uh yeah no overall I was uh I I enjoyed watching and I liked the venue and I was happy to see United States get get the job done yeah it, it was an interesting mix of, of kind of storylines on Sunday where you know Nelly Corda who had played great in, in the she first played, few sessions got so, bow raced by Charlie Hole six yeah, and four that happens too like when yeah. you when you're you send your aces out like all week to get your mm -hmm. points and then sometimes when you get to the the end you're just i think some players are just dead and I, it seems like that was that was the case with nelly who was just putting on a performance like you were talking about earlier in the week well and it looked like too that rosane wins her match six and four and at that point the americans are very close and so it's like this thing's over now and then there was a ton of intrigue coming down the stretch uh salim boudier hit an amazing shot into 18 to win that match one up yeah. that was a tough one I, I believe she won five or final final seven holes to beat lexi thompson I know, I was and that's kind of and that's kind of it for lexi right i mean i know she's gonna play a limited schedule going forward but you know you you win the event which is great but it's kind of tough for lexi to go out like that um <sighs> It just seems a lot like how her kind of her career has gone, you know, just with whenever you like we're, we're waiting for that storybook moment with Lex, it just always seemed like it just 
it, it something went wrong. Mm. And that's not to say that she's not one of the the all time great women's players because she has been. Um, it just seems like that has has been something that just has continually happened with her down uh, down the stretch in these big moments. And it was definitely much more of, of what you were talking about. You know, she did make five of seven birdies, and sometimes you can't help that. Yep. Uh, when other people go out and beat you, because I watched her play on the front nine where she's making every single putt. Right. Like she was doing everything you needed to do to win. And uh, yeah, I was I was hoping she would have kind of her storybook ending with winning mm-hmm. her match, winning the United States, uh, being on the United States side. So, um, yeah, I don't know if she'll ever get another bat being on another team um, or not. I think I, I was hearing on the broadcast that this would be your last one. But um, yeah, no, I'm. It's a team win, right? Like I think at the end of the day, it's a team win. You get, you win a cup, you get to celebrate. It I doesn't, yeah. Cares. I mean, yeah, yeah, she cares, but I think it's much to your point. Like you just, you were hoping that that Lex was was uh, going to be a a point today or winning. Well, winning and, and I and I think that would have been yeah, because looking at it now, because Coughlin and Vu both have their matches. If she wins that match. They, they, that would have been the deciding point that would have gotten yeah. them to 14 and a half. So, I mean, look, it is what it is. They still won the cup. Uh, I, I have a, a, a personal request from a buddy of mine that wanted us to chime in on the music on the T's, pumping up the fans, things like that. Like, do we, do we like this? How do we feel about the atmosphere? I, I'll say this from my standpoint. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts. Like, I, one of my favorite golf memories is sitting on the first tee at Quail Hollow for the President's Cup two years ago. And this relative unknown who just burst on the scene a couple months earlier, Tom Kim, pumping up the crowd during an away game and asked him to keep cheering while he hit his first tee shot in Sunday singles. Like that to me is I I love it at these events. I, I think that it's it's cool. I really love when when uh, players lean into atmosphere like that, where we have this this perception of golf that it always needs to be quiet and needs to be, you know, to use the word of the moment, very demure, very understated. And, and it's like, no, oh, we no. can, we let can do, all, let it all we, yeah, especially yeah. in team competitions. I think it's, I, I, I love seeing that. Gets me excited for the president's cup. I, I think once, you know, I know it's not a Ryder cup and it's not the same, but I, I tell you what, when you, I, I really feel like Canada and just these fans are going to be epic at this one. So we'll see. Uh, without a doubt. Uh, and that's and that's a perfect segue into our, our final uh, topic of the pod, which is, of course, well, it's the Pro Court Championship and a huge win for Pat and Kazire. Awesome to see him uh, get back and win. But, you know, obviously part of this discussion is going to center on the guys who played uh, in this event uh, that are going to be headed to Montreal for the President's Cup. So uh, Patton's win, man. I mean, what what are your first? I know this is a guy that you know very yeah, well, and known and him a long time, man. Yeah. So your your thoughts on this one, your reflections on on him getting it done? Well, you know, with with Patton, right? Like he's he's been a player that you know since since he graduated Auburn, he's he's always been you know at a, at every stage very good, right? He's he's a player that's tough, um, super competitive, hot tempered at times, but an incredible putter an incredible dude and just works his tail off. And I have a lot of respect for guys like that, that know what they want to do. And, and I think with Patton, it was, it was summed up so well last year after he didn't get his card back, finished outside the top 125. And when I went back and listened to that, that audio, which we're about to play, I just felt like, man, it's, it's, he had to battle this entire year when you don't know where you're going to be playing, when you're going to be playing and, and teeing it up, you know, it, it's not easy. And I, I think coming into this FedEx cup fall at 132, you know, he, he's got to find a way into the top 125 to have status for the following year. Uh, so he, he had to go play well. And Patton has been a player that when he gets it, when he just, when he just drives it decent, He's a good enough iron player and he's an incredible putter. And that's what happened this week is his ball striking showed up and uh, we, we saw him win this, this golf tournament by five shots. He's, he, he's now a three time PGA tour winner. Uh, we're going to see him at the century later this year. And I think it'd be a good time to play that, that audio because it, it just kind of puts into perspective how, um, how far he's come in a, in a year. Yeah, this is Pat and Kazire after finishing outside the top 125, uh, finishing last fall's schedule, and and just really cool to see the difference a year makes. So let's let's play this right now. 
since I was a kid. I mean, they asked me what I wanted to do when I was in second grade, and I said I want, I want to be a professional golfer, and I never changed my mind. Uh, so here I am. I've tried to keep the emotions down, but they're kind of coming on right now. Pretty disappointed. Uh, but my game is headed in the right direction. Uh, I'm playing. I'm very close to playing really well. Um, so I'm looking forward to the opportunities I'll get. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to do something good. I've always had a lot of fight in me. Um, but... Uh, you know, this this was a fight. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say a loss because uh, I can see improvement coming on fast. So, uh, like I say, I'm looking forward to the opportunities I'll get. So there you have it. Uh, I mean, that's that's patent last year. Clearly emotional, uh, heartbroken on missing out on on retaining. You know, what would have been not even full playing opportunities, top 125, but just the playing opportunities he would have had and now earns a two-year exemption. And yeah. like you said, in the century in 2025. So just a super cool journey for him in, in a year. Yeah, I, I didn't see exactly uh, where he jumped up to in the FedEx Cup. I'm sure we could pull that up pretty quickly. But uh, based on like my simple math, it was going to be somewhere around like 69th. So he was at 132, jumps all the way to somewhere in that range. I'm sure I can live figure this out right now. But I'm, um, I'm working on it for you. But basically, <laughs> for all you need to know is is everyone's chasing the next 10 in the fall. Uh, for those like Patton, he was just trying to get in the top 125 and everything after that was a bonus. So now he's completely changed his, uh, his, he'll have new goals now, which is to now make it inside from 51 to 60, which that next 10 will th then get you. He's already in century cause he won, but it'll give him an opportunity to get in that next 10 category, which would get him into uh, Pebble Beach. He jumps 62 spots from 132nd to 70th. Yep. Uh, so he, he was our you know, David Lipsky was the other big mover of the week going from 163 to 101. Um, Patrick Fishburne jumped 20 spots to 82nd. Um, so this is, you know, this is the story of the fall in the same way that we enjoy, you know, following yep. uh, tournaments like the Wyndham, you know, getting to that top 70. There are some cool storylines to be had here and guys like Patton, you know, now if he keeps playing well this fall could, could get into that next 10 to yeah. really kind of create some bigger opportunities for himself next year. And he's 200 points back of Minwoo Lee, who's at that 60th number. You saw Minwoo play this week. And you, if, if you're wondering why, you know, a guy like Minwoo is playing, just remember if you've been following uh, the show the entire year, we've kind of documented, you know, Minwoo's lack of opportunities that he's gotten. Um, I think last year, maybe he could have chased this a little bit more. We'll see if this is something that, uh, we'll see him play a little bit more as his fall goes on because I think last year, as we saw, um, Min Woo, he's a good enough player, right, Charlie? Like to to make that jump into a top thirty type of player, but the issue that he's had is the opportunities to play in the signature events. He only played in, I believe one, maybe two last year. If that, I know it sponsors exemptions uh, were, were not easy to get for mid woo, but um, which is crazy, right? He's a popular mm -hmm. player guy that I think we all want to see play, but good to see him out there this week uh, trying to play as well as Corey Connors. Um, another president's cup player, Mackenzie Hughes had a good week as well. And Nick Taylor, as if you, if you listened to us last week, didn't miss the cut. I always thought Nick might go out and shoot a number, but uh, maybe Mike, Weir got it right on the president's cup side. He, he just might've yeah. To, to just to button up men woo. I think the interesting part of last year was he was still kind of playing his, he had the special temp status and there were a number of different ways he could have lock, locked it up. He was further down that FedEx cup points list. And there was an entry point via that DP world tour top 10 that he was kind of looking at that fall schedule and trying to piece together the strategy that would get him, uh, you know, the most playing opportunities next year while also not having seen how this next 10 swing five thing was going to work for the first time. Now that he knows how it works, he's sitting 60th. I think his priorities definitely change, but I think that that is what resulted in, yes, to your point, the only signature event he played in last year was the API uh, sponsors invite there, there after playing uh, great the year before. So uh, that's, that's a nice, you kind of teed us up there on some president's cup names because there, here, here's a spread of guys that played at the Pro Corps this week that will also be showing up in Montreal. So at the top end of the leaderboard, 
You had Mackenzie Hughes finishing a tied for fourth, 13 under. Uh, Sahit the Gala finished a 12 under, tied for seventh. Uh, in addition to Corey Connors, was in that same position, 12 under, T7. Uh, then Minwoo Lee finishes at seven under, tied for 32nd. And then we get to the list of guys who did not play so well. You mentioned Nick Taylor not on that team, but of course, a talking point is a guy who missed out. He misses the cut. Uh, Max Homa and Wyndham Clark both missed cuts this weekend. And I think the guy that's probably worth talking about the most is the guy we had our eyes on coming into the week, just saying, hey, Max probably needs a big boost of confidence, a shot in the arm. Uh, would love to see him maybe drive the ball a little bit better, a little more accurately. Uh, and you know, finishes one under after two rounds, misses the cut. W- where are you on Max's level of preparedness headed in the President's Cup? Does this give you a ton of pause, or is it just like this is about what I was expecting? It would have been a nice upside to see him play really well this week. No, I, I kind of felt like he was going to be bad when right on the cut line. It just didn't seem like he was going to go out and shoot bogey-free golf. It felt like he was going to go out, have to work through some things. Uh, let's just look at his stats here at, at this at this event. He was positive off the tee. So he if was. You, if you did anything right, like this was something that we wanted to go and, and see, like how, how much better are we driving it right now? Um, and he was positive off the tee. So let's, let's just go and ch- – if that's what we're going out to accomplish – which, which is to be better off the tee than, hey, uh, would you have loved to have birdied 18, uh, which was the two-shot swing for him to uh, to make the cut? Yeah, absolutely. He ends up making a bogey um, and it's in a situation where it probably, you know, middle of the fairway at 18, most of the time will make a birdie. And unfortunately, um, did, wasn't able to get it done. But I think he battled back, made a couple birdies down the stretch uh, to try to make the cut. So with Max, I, I still... You know, I I think uh, he's he's earned you know obviously the right how well he's played over the last couple international team events that I think he's going to be mentally tough enough to go and do it. Um, and a lot of times in these events too, Charlie, uh, when you when you get in match play and you're just focusing about the uh, focusing on the other guy, you know, you, you really start to open up just playing golf and getting away from golf swing and just focusing on beating mm. the other guy. And that's why you start to see guys play just such incredible golf in these, in these formats. They hit these great shots because a lot of the times they're just, you know, not quite as conservative. They're maybe playing a little bit more aggressively and, you know, don't have anything as, as much to lose because there's not a cut they're worrying about. They're just trying to, you know, play, you know, against the other guy and whatever that is, you know, if it's aggressive that day or they can play more conservatively because the guy's hacking it around. I mean, that's, that's another thing too, that I think Max, Max brings, which is that, you know, he's a great match play player right now. It's a match play dog. He's been the best American player the last two competitions. You know, the the, the last presidents and Riders Cup. You know, it was was really you know he was the guy for both those teams, even though one of those was a losing effort. Uh, and I went to the same place you did after that first round of just let's let's dig into the stats. Let's see how he's driving the ball. It was it was interesting. So so he was positive strokes gained off the tee as you mentioned, but just digging further into those stats, he was uh, he he. Exact same driving accuracy both days. Hit seven to fourteen fairways These both are narrow, days. Narrow fairways, so they're they're firm. They're hard to hit. Just just to, they're not they're not easy to hit. Just to put that in perspective. Sure, uh, it, but I think th- the interesting stat that I found was in, in the split between the days in terms of his scoring was uh, in that first round he makes fifteen pars, two birdies, and one bogey. Uh, on Friday, he makes six birdies, six pars, and six bogeys. So what? why is that interesting to me? Because that same thing you're talking about, that match play mentality of, you know, hey, the, the bogeys maybe don't hurt as much. Like if you're going out and trying to make some birdies, you know, that's where you can kind of really win these sort of matches or have a partner alongside you to kind of pick you up. So, you know, maybe playing a little more aggressive on that Friday to tune it up and, and misses the cut, but still make some birdies. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that as we head out of this deal is uh, – that you want to see six birdies. Like yes. I, I, anytime as a player, I felt like I was in a rut and I was just not being able to figure it out. I wanted to have the offense, like give me the birdies and let me go figure it out from there. Because when you're, when you're feel like you can make, you know, five or six birdies around, it starts to open up your game. You, you start, what you realize is like, okay, I'm doing some things very well. I just got to just get a little bit better in the areas um, where I'm just kind of giving away shots. 
Yeah, makes a ton of sense. And so that's, you know, maybe that's your that's your max home of silver lining as we uh, head up to Montreal. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other thoughts there on? I mean, Wyndham, it looks like had uh, that second round blew up for him in a couple spots. He had a triple uh, on the par five fifth and then, you know, finishes bogey, double bogey to miss the cut. Uh, any concern there at all? There were also some comments earlier in the week about talking, you know, didn't feel like he was prepared as he wanted to be going into the Ryder Cup and how that's something he's taken to his prep this time for President's Cup. You know, for him, saw a member of this team, no real questions about his standing. But did you, you know, anything there on Wyndham or other guys heading into Montreal that was sort of a flag for you? No, I think Thigal is going to have a heck of a President's Cup. Yeah. I, I, just, I just keep getting that feeling with him. Um, and then talking with Tom Kim, by the way, this week, he just said the golf course is pretty narrow uh, from when they did that scouting trip. He thought it was a little soft um, and there was some rough out there. So that was something interesting too. just getting a, a sneak peek with uh, with Tom Kim, having a little conversation with him on uh, Royal Montreal. Yeah. Over a glass of uh, Pappy, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> that you no, want. I'm not open that, man. I'm going to keep that. You're going to keep up. that. How long are you going to keep that? What's what's your play on that? Is that just kind of sit on a shelf for a while? Uh, or? That's a Christmas drinker type of thing. Maybe get, you mm. know, drink with uh, with with, uh, you know, father in law, dad, brother, brother in law, that type of deal. Just open it. Every kind of joy sipping on that deal. OK. All right. There you go. And and for Tom Kim, it's just a, a really nice <laughs> ornament in his house. <laughs> uh, we are, Kali, close to an hour and a half in. Uh, we've covered a lot of golf here. Uh, any any final thoughts you want to leave the good people with, Smiley, before we – I think I think the next time you're going to tune into this feed is when we're going to hear about Scotty Scheffler playing pickleball. So that's well, the tease heard, I'm going to leave you, you with. You heard most of it. I mean, uh, Golden will just had – he'll definitely just be able Add to – some color. Yes, definitely so. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll check your text messages, Charlie, because I sent you a picture of, okay. of Pat and Kazire and I. Have, I think you need to pull that up on the way out. And I just want to send, again, more congratulations to Pat. And uh, he's, he's been very good to me over the years. Uh, even times with, with struggle, he was always a guy that would put his arm around my shoulder and tell me how, uh, just like we're doing right here, Look put his arm around my shoulder. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see Pat and sick hair and you can see my duck bill hat. Um, but yeah, always been somebody that, uh, always looked up to the guy and he's always been a good friend of me. So, um, our, you know, our Francie and I love the Kazars and we couldn't be more happy for Pat. And, um, it seems like this is the, the the hump to get over now that he can set him up set himself up now to be able to go and uh you know play com more comfortably out on tour and and uh hopefully build off of uh, a great week here uh this week in napa what what is the age difference here because either you're pre growth spurt or i'm like oh. 12 13 division he's 17 yeah. 18 division oh, okay would be the thing here. much more understandable much yeah. more understandable <laughs> it's like man this guy is uh he should she missed his calling should have been playing basketball but that makes a, <laughs> that makes a lot more sense <laughs> he's a big man have you never seen pat in person he's a big old boy he looks he like looks, he put looks him solid. and ernie else next to each other they look about the same size oh, i like that comp that's good uh, well, there you go. That that's about a wrap for us this week. Uh, and yeah, we, we we tease what's coming up next, and then we're gonna be off to Tobacco Road to record some stuff on Wednesday. That you should just make sure you're subscribed to that YouTube because that's gonna be some fun stuff coming soon. Uh, if if we don't get rained out, you seen that forecast? Bring uh, some rain gloves. Okay, is it that bad? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, we'll 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 get there when we get there. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate you watching and listening as always, and uh, we will talk to you back here very soon. You know, I listen to this podcast. It's really cool. And all of our First time. fans and subscribers, but make sure you like and subscribe. It's cool to see what you guys are doing. I know golf fans appreciate it, but we, we do too, so please keep it up. For all the good people on YouTube, like and subscribe. You guys have some good takes, so I'm happy to come on and, and shoot the